the afternoon session. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Priya Morjani from UC Berkeley, who's going to talk about how very big, uh, large scale omics data sets are helping her to understand the evolution of the germline mutation rate in humans. Hi everyone, thanks for joining the afternoon session and to the organizers for giving me an opportunity to share some of our recent work with you. Uh, as way of introduction, my lab works on genomic data and there are three main uh, questions that we ask in our lab. One of them is to understand how evolutionary processes generate all the genetic variation we observe around us. We then try to use this understanding as a molecular clock to learn about when different evolutionary events occurred or, uh, in our history and use that to then understand human adaptation and disease. Uh, how do, uh, can, I, can everyone hear me clearly? Do you prefer if I remove my mask or keep it on? Okay. Um, and so today I'm actually going to talk about this very first topic because it's really fundamental to everything that we do in our lab and in general in evolutionary biology. And understanding the germline mutation rate is really important for, uh, because it's the main source of uh, evolutionary novelty. It's the cause of many heritable diseases and cancers. And also because mutations occur steadily over time, they provide a record of the time elapsed and hence act as a molecular clock for learning about when different evolutionary events occurred. Okay, I might remove my mask. Um, the question of mutation rate is, as I said, really fundamental to everything we do, and the earliest estimates of mutation rate actually date back to 1930s, even before it was appreciated that DNA is the hereditary material. Some seminal work done by uh, Haldane uh, measured the rate of hemophilia in families and tried to infer what the mutation rate might be. And today with large omics data sets, everything that we know about mutation rate is being revised. There are large data sets now available for pedigrees. These are uh, trios, either father, mother, and child, or large families, data for thousands of different uh, individuals, uh, and also large amounts of data across different species. We've seen some of these discussed at this meeting also with the Earth uh, Biome Project and the Darwin's Tree of Life Project. And all of this is really revising how, what we think of mutation rate. So uh, let's first uh, review what we re know about mutation rate. So the textbook view of mutation rates is that mutations occur during development and ontogenesis, where uh, in oocytes, all the mutations occur by the birth of the future mother. And in spermatogonial cells, these divide uh, during development and then divide post-puberty uh, in males. Such that if you wanted to build a model, we could then just conceptualize this as there are a large number of divisions in females between conception and birth. And then there is a period of stasis where there are no more uh, cell divisions in the female germline. In males, the uh, germ cell divisions occur during conception and birth. Then there is a period of stasis until puberty. And then post puberty, the male germline again, the spermatogonial cells continue dividing. Each mutation is an opportunity, uh, each cell division is an opportunity for uh, some errors to occur. And those can get passed on to the next generation as the germline mutations. So the number of mutations in an offspring then depends upon the different stage at which the uh, mutations occur. So the uh, different number of cell divisions that occur in each of these stages and the mutation rate in these stages. Now let's look at what we learned from the uh, sequencing of uh, families. We can directly sequence the genome of the parents and the offspring. And then at each position of the genome, we can ask, does the sequence of the offspring differ from that of the parents? You control for certain uh, errors in sequencing, coverage, fil uh, apply filters to be sure that this is not just a false positive or an artifact of sequencing, but indeed actually a germline uh, mutation, um, uh, mutation. And then you can simply ask, how does the mutation rate depend upon the age of the parents? On average, we find that an offspring has around 70 de novo mutations. Uh, between 70 to 100 actually, and this depends upon the age of the parents. For every year increase in the father's age, an offspring gets additional 1.5 mutations, and for every year increase in the mother's age, the offspring gets 0.4 additional mutations. 
The father's age, of course, is consistent with what I showed you that there are continuous divisions on the male germline, but the uh, mother's age effect is quite puzzling. And uh, you would expect that there should be a flat line here because there should be no increase in the number of mutations with the age of the mother because the ogonial cells are not dividing. However, mutations can occur both because of DNA damage. These can be endogenous or exogenous uh, sources of damage that can lead to uh, germline mutations. And so in the females, you can expect that there is increase in the rate due to DNA damage. And then in the uh, male germline, you can expect that this is because of replication errors and uh, DNA damage. And on average, males have Three, fourth, uh, three males contribute three fourth of the mutations and females contribute one fourth. So on average, males have like th contribute three times more mutations than uh, the females. And you would expect that this is largely because of the increased mutations post puberty in males. However, with this data, we can also partition the uh, male bias in mutation with age. So you can go in and look at all the pedigrees whose parents were around 20 years of age and estimate what is the male bias in mutation rate. And then similarly, you can estimate the male bias with uh, increasing age of the parents. And what you find is surprisingly a flat line. We expect this line to be increasing linearly or even others have been even suggested exponentially with age, but instead we find a flat line. This suggests that potentially more mutations are occurring due to DNA damage, which might be similar in males and females. We can also look at this across different species. So here each point is uh, data for pedigrees in that species. And what we are looking at is just the proportion of paternal mutations at average age in these species. And despite these species ranging in uh, different uh, parental ages or different uh, generation times, mating systems, we find that the uh, male bias and mutation rate is roughly constant with age. And this suggests that mutations not only occur due to replication errors, but they also occur in large part due to non-replicative sources or DNA damage, which can be both endogenous and uh, exogenous. And this uh, well mirrors the literature from cancer genomics, where we are also finding that uh, exogenous and endogenous sources can also have a big impact on mutation rate. Another thing we can do is we can divide the mutations in the context in which they occur. So we can look at the type of mutation. So looking at C2G versus C2A mutations, and then we can investigate how the rate of mutation changes with the age of the parents. Uh, we divide the mutations in different types because these give us hints about what the underlying mechanism might be. So if you look at CPG mutations, these primarily occur due to uh, methylation. Uh, driven mutations. And since the male germline is methylated for a longer period than the female germline, what you find is that uh, there is increase in mutation rate with the father's age and not really with the mother's age. We can also look at other types of mutations like C2G mutations, and these seem to increase disproportionately with the mother's age versus the father's age. And we know from their uh, location and other investigation that these mutations are largely happening due to double strand breaks. And so this means that not only the mutation rate, but actually the spectrum of mutations or the proportions of different types of mutations varies across different, uh, 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 across males and females. Now, uh, another uh, classic discovery in evolutionary biology is the use of the molecular clock. We tend to assume that the mutation rate is constant with uh, age. And so we can use uh, divergence across different species and infer what is the time of uh, divergence. Now, if we look at uh, closely related species here, I'm showing you 10 different primates, and we look at neutral substitutions in these primates and then estimate how uh, different these rates are. We find that the rates differ quite substantially. We find that if you compare humans and chimpanzees, the rates differ by about 2%. Humans and orangs or other apes differ by almost 10%. You, uh, apes and old world monkeys differ by 40%. The rates are about 40% higher in uh, old world monkeys and almost uh, twofold higher in new world monkeys compared to apes. Again, we can break down the mutations by the type. So we can look at AT transitions or CPG transitions. And we find even the proportions of these mutations differ across different uh, primates, suggesting that not only the mutation rate, but the spectrum is also changing across closely related species. A third surprise has been that even human, across human populations, there are differences in mutation rate. 
There's essentially no base composition across human populations. The replication machinery is very similar or is identical across humans. And yet when you estimate the rate of say C2A mutations or the proportions of C2A mutations in different contexts in Europeans or Africans, you start finding that these rates differ. Here, the, uh, each of these comparisons looks at a different context uh, and the colors indicate the how significantly different the rates are. All the blocks with dots are showing you that these are significant differences after correcting for multiple hypothesis testing. Now, one of the most significant differences is a mutation um, type called TCC to TTC mutations, where you find that this mutation is present at about 20% higher frequency in Europeans compared to other non-European populations. Uh, and uh, this transient change has been suggested to perhaps be because of UV exposure or genetic modifiers. And I'll talk about this example further in the next few slides also. So let's just look at what are some of the processes that impact mutation rate. So in an off, each offspring has its own mutation spectrum. And this spectrum depends upon the parental age, as I showed you. It also depends upon environmental exposures. It also depends upon the replication machinery of the parents or DNA modifiers in their genomes. Over time, this forms the mutation spectrum of a population. But there are other factors that matter in this case also. One is demography that matters. Another one is selection. Selection purges out deleterious mutations. And another factor that matters is bias gene conversion. This is a bias in how you repair uh, DNA. So in a heteroduplex, when you have a mismatch, there's a preferential bias towards repairing from the uh, from C to G basis versus D to A basis. So this acts like selection, where over time this shifts the genome towards being a more GC genome. And there are counteracting forces in the genome that bring it back to equilibrium where the GC content doesn't change much, but there can be subtle differences because of bias gene conversion also. Now, when we look at this composite effect at the end, after many, many generations, any of these factors could actually matter. And we, don't, uh, we can't really conclude that the differences we are observing today are because of parental age or DNA modifiers or environmental exposures. And so for the rest of the talk, this is the question that I'll focus on and how we did some recent work to try to understand what might be some of the causes of the differences we are observing in humans. And this is work uh, jointly led with Zive Gao, who's at University of Pennsylvania, and by a graduate student uh, in my group, Yulin Zhang. And the question we asked is, how many changes have occurred in the human mutation spectrum? When and in which populations did these occur? And what are some of the causes of these differences? Um, and uh, for the last question, in the interest of time, I won't go through all the parts, but I'll show you some uh, hints at what we are learning. So in order to uh, really understand what are some of the causes, we developed a new framework where we uh, tried to add a time dimension to understand when the differences occur across populations. And we also control for effects of selection and bias gene conversion. So in order to add the time dimension, what we did is we took all the data from Thousand Genomes Project and we uh, reconstructed the entire ancestral recombination graph of these uh, individuals. What that mean is, means is just a fancy way of saying we did some genealogical reconstruction such that we divided the genome into bits where there is no recombination and we tried to build trees in those recombinations uh, in those uh, regions. And then we place down mutations on these trees such that the branch line tells us what the time of the mutation is. We, we do this for every population um, together and then separately also estimate the uh, ages of the mutations so that now we can tell if we are looking at a mutation that uh, is 10 generations old, it's uh, the same mutation, similar type uh, age of mutations in other populations also. To control for bias gene conversion, what we do is we look at mutation types that are similarly impacted by bias gene conversion. I told you the predominant bias is between towards a shift from weaker bases, that is T, uh, A and T, to stronger bases, that is C and G. And so we can just compare mutation types like uh, T to C and T to G, which are both favored by bias gene conversion. 
Similarly, we can look at mutations which are not affected by biased gene conversion like C2G mutations or T2A mutations. And so rather than comparing the total number of mutations or the, uh, or the proportions of mutations, what we do is we compare ratios of mutations. And in order to uh, control for selection, we just remove regions that might be selected. Uh, and we have many ways of trying to control even for link selection where we can look at mostly neutral mutations in the genome. And so this is what we uh, get at the end of our, uh, uh, after applying our framework. On the y-axis is the age of every mutation in the genome. We have about uh, 10 million mutations in this analysis. What we have done is we've just divided it by the ages. These estimates are in generations. For every mutation, we can estimate how, when did this mutation arise based on our genealogical reconstruction. We can then estimate the ratio of two types of mutations. Uh, and then here uh, we are looking at, let's say, the 48 to 107 generation mutations. We bin this uh, mutations in different uh, bins of equal size. We have done the binning in many different ways. And so the binning doesn't really affect things. Uh, and then we estimate the ratio of these two types of mutations for all the mutations at this particular age. We can repeat this exercise for different age bins for different types of uh, mutations. And when we do this very uh, nicely, we confirm the European specific acceleration that was found in the previous analysis. Uh, so in this analysis, I was showing you data for Northern Europeans, and we find this acceleration that I had shown you earlier, uh, also like the other study. We can also do the same analysis for multiple populations. Here we are looking at one Northern European population, East Asian population, and a West African population. We do the analysis similarly for each population separately, and then we can compare how different these different uh, populations are or at what rate these mutations occur. And when we do this, we find that there are three key differences. We find the European acceleration at this uh, uh, TCC mutations, which is at C2, T2, C2A mutations at non-CPG sites. We also find a new signal where we find that there is divergence of C2G to T2A ratios across uh, all human populations. Interestingly, whatever the cause might be is still ongoing because the differences are present even in the most recent time bin. Whereas with the TT, uh, TCC mutation, you find that whatever the causes were, no longer are active and such that all human populations have the same rates now. And we find surprisingly a third signal which is present at the T2C to T2G mutations at very old mutations. Uh, and these uh, mutations predate out of Africa migration such that all these mutations must have arisen in the common ancestors of all modern humans, but that there are no population differences at this stage, except our analysis suggests that there might be some differences at this stage. So I'll now go through each one of these signals in turn to sh show you how we are trying to understand the mechanisms that underlie these. For the TCC signal, a lot of analysis has previously been done that suggests that there are certain mutational contexts that are enriched for these mutations. These contexts are actually surprisingly linked to UV exposure and are often seen in skin cancers where the TCC context plus some additional contexts appear to be driving these differences. And so what we first did is in our framework, try to uh, look at specifically this context to see if we also see uh, enrichment in these contexts. And indeed our signals are uh, significant in this case. We also applied it uh, after removing this context. So we remove all of these extended contexts and we still find that there are differences across Europeans and non-Europeans, suggesting that whatever uh, the causes are, are not solely driven by these uh, mutational contexts. And so it's always, it's been really puzzling to think of how UV might affect the germline. Uh, and so in some ways, this is reassuring that while this is correlated to the signal, it's probably not driving the signal. We have some other uh, results in the lab, which we are still investigating, which suggests that there are certain loss of function mutations in certain mismatch repair gene that might be causing these differences. This is consistent with another hypothesis that was also put forth by uh, the original study uh, from uh, Jonathan Pritchard and Kelly Harris that suggested that this might be related to genetic modifiers, which might be segregating in human populations, and that might have led to some differences. 
Uh, others have also suggested that maybe the mean age of reproduction differs across uh, Europeans and non-Europeans, and that might be driving these differences. And we are investigating all of these hypotheses. Another signal I showed you is the C2G to T2A uh, signal. Uh, in order to understand which, uh, which of these mutation types is driving this signal, we first looked at, the, we took these ratios and just changed the numerator in this case to figure out if which one of these is driving the signal. So first we looked at the T2G to T2A mutations. We found that there were still significant differences in these bins. We looked at uh, T2C to T2A differences. We still found the differences. But however, when we look at C2G to C2A mutations, we find that there are almost no significant differences. And so we find that these mutations are actually driven by a change in the T2A mutation rates. We still don't know what the cause of this is. We have looked at signatures, but we can't really find anything in the annotated cancer literature or environmental exposure literature to figure out what might be causing these differences. The one exciting thing about this mutation type, as I mentioned, is that these differences are still present in, uh, in human populations. So whatever the forces that differentiates this mutation is still uh, present and potentially we can sequence pedigrees and try to learn about what these causes might be. And now I'll talk about the third signal, which is uh, in some ways uh, one of my uh, one of the most interesting uh, to me, which I uh, which is because these mutations that where we find differences in, across Africans and non-Africans appear to have occurred uh, are dated to be very old, and yet uh, there seem to be population differences. And so first, we were sure that this might be because of technical errors. In particular, all of the results that I'm showing you is for derived variants. So these are mutations that arose on the human lineage uh, since separation from chimpanzees. And so we figured that perhaps there was some error in our polarization of the data. And so we tried to repolarize the data using chimpanzees. And we found that the signal is still present, in fact, even stronger. Uh, and then we reason that one difference between Africans and non-Africans is their history of Neanderthal ancestry. We might predict that if there are certain variants that integrate from Neanderthals into non-Africans, those might look very different compared to the variants in the common ancestor of all modern humans. And so if we could fight, identify the Neanderthal integrest variants and remove those from our analysis, we would not see any of these differences. And when we do this analysis, we actually still find the differences are quite significant across humans, suggesting that this difference is not driven by Neanderthal gene flow in non-Africans. Next thing we did is further try to uh, use this idea of polarizing the data by looking at uh, the sharing with different archaic populations and trying to figure out when these mutations arose. Did they arise here uh, on the Neanderthal lineage so that they integrate back into non-Africans? This is the hypothesis we uh, tested in the previous uh, uh, slide. We also looked at mutations perhaps that arose on the Denisovan lineage and integrate into uh, modern humans, or the mutations that arose in this shared branch across all uh, uh, modern humans and archaic populations. So here are the results. If we look at just Denisova, derived mutations, we find still uh, and remove them, we still see there are significant differences such that these are not driving the signal. We can do the same with Neanderthal derived mutations. Again, like the previous slide, we see these mutations, uh, these are not driving the signal. But if you remove these shared mutations that are extremely old and predate the uh, separation of modern humans and archaic populations, it seems that these are the mutations that are driving the signal. It's the model. Uh, that, uh, uh, oh, and so then we also tried to figure out again, is it the T2C or T2G mutation? In this case, we borrowed ideas from cancer literature where we looked at uh, what are some of the signatures in which these mutations occur. Uh, and we identified uh, a couple of mutational contexts that appear to be driving these uh, mutations. In particular, one signature at T2C mutations in these three contexts appears to be uh, entirely driving the differences across human populations, suggesting that either genetic modifiers or some exogenous forces that might leave behind this footprint is causing these differences. 
And so the model that emerges from these analysis is that at some point in the past, there were some mutational changes in an ancient ancestor of ours. And these mutations are now present in modern humans, either potentially through gene flow back into modern humans or due to population structure. Others have proposed that there might be two possibilities, that there is some ghost ancestry in African and non-African populations, uh, mutations that arose at some point in the past that integrate into uh, at this uh, point in human uh, evolution. This figure is entirely from this paper and not related to our analysis. It just coincidentally fits very well with our results. Another model that has been proposed is this model of uh, structure in the stem population of uh, humans, where uh, there is evidence from the fossil record that there is there were many, many human populations um, at some point in the past, and these might actually have uh, differential contributions to living humans today. And today we are now investigating uh, which one of these models fits our data better. So some implications of this analysis is that we find that there are not uh, many non-replicative sources that can also impact, uh, that have non-negligible force in shaping the mutation spectrum, like replicative mutations. Demography and admixture has pervasive impacts on shaping uh, our uh, genetic variation and even impacts very fundamental uh, processes like mutation rate. Uh, and also this has uh, some important implications for molecular clock and its use, where we find that uh, it's very unsteady at short time scales where the rates differ by 10 to 15% across human populations, but puzzlingly across humans and chimpanzees, they differ only by 2%. So there must be some stabilizing selection to keep mutation rate at a lower uh, rate and to have, uh, to have similar rates across groups. We are now looking at these questions using other kinds of omics data, in particular non-human species data, looking at single cell sequencing data, and then looking at leveraging hybrid genomes where we can actually look at the uh, two copies of different genomes in the same uh, cell and then see how those get affected by uh, different uh, replication uh, machinery. Uh, with that, I would like to thank my uh, collaborators, in particular Zibe Gao and Yulin Zhang, who led much of the work. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, all my funding sources, in particular Coret for funding the research on the mutation rate, uh, and my lab for very helpful discussions throughout the projects. Thank you very much. I hope I'm not that's cool. You can infer so back in time, much so far back in time in a population specific way. Yeah. Looks like we have a couple questions. Thanks so much. It was really wonderful um, to see this work with, with the ARGs, very, very, very smart and thousand genomes. I, I, I had one basic question, maybe I misunderstood this, but you know, mapping the mutation signatures in the thousand genomes data is really germline, and you can look, look historically where mutations occur. If you map this to this cancer signatures, you know, isn't that surprising that you find UV signatures because yeah. that's a somatic mutation? So how does that get into the germline? You know, obviously, yeah. oocytes don't get all that much sun, and neither does male sperm. So do you have an explanation for that? And yeah. would you not also have to measure somatic mutations in this sexual tissues to really map this over? I mean, that seemed very puzzling to me that you could find those. Yeah, so it is very puzzling to almost everybody because we don't expect the germline to be impacted by UV. Uh, and so it's been quite puzzling to see this matching of the signature. I think this is correlation and not causation, though we are investigating that. Uh, I think we don't have to be concerned about the somatic versus germline analysis because in the uh, when you sequence a, a pool of cells, you predominantly pick up the germline mutations in those cells, and we are not looking at sort of the minority population as people do for somatic cells. Uh, we have also replicated this uh, anal uh, replicated these results in multiple other data sets, and they seem to be quite robust. Uh, I think it's actually uh, correlation, and we have some hints with a gene that appears to be uh, potentially has a loss of function uh, mutation, and that might be driving the difference. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so one of the big conundrums in sort of cross-population studies are the different kinds of cancers that you get in different populations, yeah. right? HER2 positive, yeah. ER positive versus not. And BRAF 
is super interesting because there's this this super recurrent v600 e yeah mutation it's the one that like there was a massive paper yeah. a couple of weeks ago that everybody got cured right right with yeah. this immunotherapy so yeah. that VRAF V600E mutation is actually a perfect control for you yeah. for the T to A versus the, the T to G. Yeah, that's a great idea. We'll be, because definitely look into that. In fact, when you I, I just sort of looked it up. When you look at V600E to D yeah. in cancer, like yeah. you'd expect 50-50 based on, yeah, exactly. right? Because of the yeah. fourfold degeneracy doesn't add. In fact, it's like 95% V to E versus V to oh, D. Wow. And so you have this circulating impact of this that then goes to all of these other tissues. So yeah. it could go gonadal, even if its origin is somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. That's right? an so, important point. We'll try to look for specifically that type of mutation to see if that's leading to the differences. My, uh, my suggestion is actually slightly, which is look at the, um, if you can, data from liquid biopsy okay because that circulating cell-free dna data yeah may actually be different among current ethnic groups in a way that could allow you to test some of this with the natural controls that there are in the genetic code because if you could tie it back to that yeah absolutely you, you, there's even a, a, another element which is the role that hla and other circulating kind of natural suppressors of these are having? Because my guess is it, it's not crazy, right? Like humans didn't yeah. need to adapt to live at yeah. not only the UV light, but altitude that gives you different spectrum of mutation for a long time. So anyway, I, I think it's a real signal. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, we are really interested in trying to set understand up. the mechanisms. Brian, can you get set up? Go ahead, go ahead and get set up. Um, we're gonna take one question quickly, a quick one while Ryan's sitting up. <laughs> Very quick, great work. Um, I, I don't know if I understood what you uh, concluded about the non-replicative yeah. versus um, how did that does that square with the three times more mutation rate in males versus females, and yeah. also the age dependence of the father, yeah. and um, versus no age dependence across the primates. Yeah, I mean, I think that is the puzzle. Like we always expect that that increases with the age of the parents, right? Uh, with the age of the father, the continuous divisions that happen in the spermatogonial cells, except in pedigree data, you find it's flat. Yeah. And if the uh, mutations are predominantly occurring due to non-replicative sources at similar rates in males and females, then that would be the expectation. Uh, and so that's why we think that non-replicative mutations also have a really big impact. And this is seen in cancer literature too. A lot of ex, you know, exogenous sources or endo endogenous mutation modifiers, double strand breaks are also leading to a large fraction of mutations. Thank you, Priya. Our next speaker is Ryan Shiki from Institut Pasteur. 